<laughs> Driving a Jeep through a swamp. Crazy. I'm Buck. I'm getting stuck. Oh, God. Conversations. Traffic out here is crazy today. In the muck. In my truck. Oh, my God. That was insane. Oh, f It's a Jeep. I'm stuck in a truck with Buck. <laughs> Today I'm getting stuck in a truck with Mike Downey. Kevin. Mike. Whoa. How's it going, brother? So Mike's co-founder of the Downey Wenjack Fund. He's a filmmaker, and he's Gord Downey's older brother. We're taking the Jeep out. We're going to get stuck in the woods. But before we roll out, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. So should I have a driver's license for this? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessary. This is fun. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. The snow actually makes it pretty, eh? Yeah. Kind of dramatic. <laughs> if we get stuck out here and we freeze to death, <laughs> it'll be really pretty. I've been admiring your thigh there. I might have to take a couple <laughs> chomps. No, I was I was assured there'd be no cannibalism today. <laughs> well, you know, people say things. Yeah. Remember that movie uh, about the soccer players crashed in the Andes or whatever? In the Andes. Holy cow. <laughs> and then that dude just walked out, didn't it? He's just like, screw this, I'm not eating any more people. <laughs> and he left. And he walked out of the mountains. Yeah, walked yeah. down into the valley, dude. Yeah. Do and I avoid the puddles? No. Oh. Uh, you do whatever you want. <laughs> do this is you your want. Jeep, right? It is my daily driving Jeep. Okay, so and, uh, yeah, you go into a tree, that'll... I'm not saying I'm not terrified right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you trust me. But, but I'll be thumbing around. <laughs> if we have if a I see you hitchhiking, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will pick you up. Yeah. I'll be an Uber. <laughs> You are uh, reading anything cool lately? I will say this, the book that I read this year that blew my mind was the Winston Churchill biography by Andrew Roberts, A Walk With Destiny. Oh yeah? Winston Churchill, perhaps the greatest human being of the 20th century. Um, you cannot believe all the things that happened to him way before the Second World War. He got his ass handed to him in Turkey, yeah? He did, he yeah, did, He was yeah. the first Lord of the Admiralty for he was. He was. years, and then didn't he get, he got replaced, didn't he? He did, he did. They, they took him out, and then, in the First World War, uh, he went into active duty in, in France. He joined a unit, um, yeah, and he was in the trenches, and it was not a photo shoot. Do you know that before the First World War, he had already participated in five major battles in five different wars, like not... Was so, that like the Boer War? Or am no, I definitely off? the Boer War. He went to India. He would use everything at his disposal to get to the action. So he used his political connections. He was not a member of parliament yet. All the family connections helped to get him into battle. But he went to Cuba and fought. Oh, wow. Well. And, I mean... Was he a... He was captured. He escaped. I like, can't... Yeah, oh, and get this. He was almost always working as a journalist. It's kind of how he made his money, as a journalist. What courage to, you know, to... It's one thing to go once. Yeah. But then when you've seen it and you know oh, what yeah. you're going back into, to go again, yeah. that is like... Yeah. It's almost like he, this destiny, like he really, I think he knew that he wasn't just going to get picked off by some stray bullet. And, uh, and that his, but there, as a matter of fact, there's a part of his life where he tells a, I mean, this is in his, you know, his uh, private school uh, in England. And he tells a classmate that he believes that he is going to be tested, that the country is going to be tested, and that they're going to be facing an invasion sometime in the future. And that he is going to rise up and he's going to save the country from being, I mean, he basically predicted me. the second world war and that he was going to play a pivotal role. And he had this premonition in his teens. And of course, it doesn't, ha doesn't happen for like 50 years. It's yeah. incredible. You know, when thinking about history, all those little pivotal moments that, you know, if, if it had gone the other way, oh. we would be living in an yeah. absolutely, it's completely absolutely different world. Yeah. You know what I saw on TV the other day, man? It's been on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, yeah. So there's this... Um, unidentified sub, it's a Russian sub cruising around and they, I guess they all know where everybody is. Right. So, but there's this uh, sub off the coast of the United States, they don't know what the hell it is. So they decide to fake depth charge it. So they're dropping depth charges that don't really have the concussive uh -huh. ability to destroy the submarine. And they call Russia and say, look, we've got one of your subs and this is what we're doing. We're dropping fake depth, depth charges on it so that 
because things were so heated. It was on the brink of nuclear annihilation. So anyway, the guys in the sub have no contact back with uh, Moscow. They think they're being actually depth charged. Yeah. And they you take three people to fire the missiles. Two of them said yes, and one of them said no. And they were about to fire they a were about nuclear warhead? They were to fire nuclear warheads off the coast of the United States. This guy was in the K-19 when they had their nuclear uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, in my opinion, I think seeing the effects of radiation might have triggered something in his head that said, we, we just cannot do this. This one dude might have saved the entire friggin' world. You know what I mean? In 1963. 1963. Right around the time of the Cuban Missile yeah, Crisis and all yeah, those tensions. Everybody, yeah, it was all so tense. So, wow. You know, it's those little things in history that, you know, everything could have been annihilated yeah. except for one dude. And nobody knows who the guy is, you know. He's just some, some Russian sailor guy who possibly saved the planet. I think history is, is absolutely fascinating. And, you know, even, <laughs> even in Canada, we have this, you know, this history that we told ourselves for all those decades and generations. And, it's almost like the true history of this country has just been coming out in the last few years, I feel like, with, you know, when you think about residential schools yeah. and the, the, what was called the Indian uh, Pass system and um, just, you know, like confederation, the whole thing. That residential school thing, man, holy... Can you imagine if someone came in and took your kids away? You, like, them's fighting words, right? Oh, well, What are oh, you gonna, you'd and lose your friggin' mind. You'd lose your mind, and to think that, you know, this happened generation after generation. And, I, know. I mean, just the pain, and, and like, the, the, the sense of loss um, that these families went through. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, these, these kids grew up not being raised by their parents, then they become yeah. parents, and then they have children, even if they can keep it together, and then their kids get taken away to residential yeah, school. It's like, a snowball. It's you know. unbelievable. Un unbelievable. Yeah. Who says that as an idea, and everybody else goes, "Yeah, that's great. That's a great uh, idea. Let's oof. take a let's take these people's children away from them." They saw these people as savages, and, and they saw them, you know, like their culture was worthless. Completely. That their worthless. spirituality was worthless. That they totally. didn't understand. You know, they weren't yeah. Christian, and they needed to be brought into the church. They needed to be uh, educated, which of course they weren't. These things were like yeah. work camps. I mean, it's cultural genocide, right? Really, it is. The, like, let's get rid of the yeah. language. Let's uh -huh. get rid of the culture. Let's get rid of the, you know, whatever they've got. Whatever you have been raised to believe is, you know, sort of important and your identity, that's gone. I mean, just imagine what these, what these kids must have gone through. Not only the sense of, you know, being separated from their family and from their culture. Terrifying. Terrifying. Well, yeah, and you're so young too at the I mean, time, and then listen. I know kids that go to Lord camp flies, man. and get freaked out. I know. I mean, yeah. I was I was scared shitless at uh, when I went to camp when I was I don't know, six, seven years old. I thought I'd never see my family again. Oh, I yeah. was away for two weeks, plus thirty got, miles from uh, Kingston. Plus, you got some guy who is fully ready to physically punish you. Oh yeah, you yeah. know it, how scary. Yeah. No. Do you it's, think there was any altruism behind the idea at the time, like where? Did they think they were doing right, or did they know they were doing wrong? You know, I wonder. Uh, well, I, I do think that, uh, you know, if they thought that these kids were going to get an education and live a better life, m maybe that's possible. Maybe. I do think that you, whenever you have a situation where you see that you've got a superior race and an inferior race, no good is going to come out of it. No. You, you are treating somebody as subhuman. As soon as you give somebody license and tell them, oh, this person's a bad person. Like the Stanford prison oh, experiment. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, You'll uh, torture this person, actually. Uh -huh. and, you're, and these people aren't monsters. No, they're, they're normal. They're normal people. Yeah. You know, we destroyed their system of government and yeah. imposed our system of government on them, which caused untold problems yeah. because that's not how they were running the show before oh, yeah. we came along. Oh. There's not one dude in charge. Oh, no. You know, so. Well, do you know that, that in many of these, for many of these uh, First Nations, uh, I don't know about the Inuit, uh, they were, in many uh, cases, they were matriarchal. Certainly uh, mm. during, uh, you know, if there was peace, they were matriarchal. And when the, the first, you know, settlers came um, and the Europeans and they were had any kind of negotiation, they're like, Hey, you have to stop bringing these women in. Like this is, this is men. Men do this. So you talk about being advanced. The women were running the show, and the women understood so much more about the running of the village, the running of the community. 
Like, anyway. Let's be serious. Yeah. Women are smarter than men. They are. <laughs> they run things. <laughs> like they, they do it better. So you've got a couple uh, classic cars right here. I do. I love the old cars. I've got a uh, 1968 Mercedes 250 SE. Oh, yeah. Two-door coupe. Uh, do you have a, a chauffeur? Son of a <laughs> I do. Um, That's a sweet old ride. Oh, it's a great they old They built ride. those and, things and it, like and it, run, and it runs well. When you drive it, it it makes people happy. And it's got the, one of these old <laughs> horns, kind of wow, wow, and, <laughs> yeah. and you give it a little shot on the yeah. horn, and it kind of, it's great. Like, it's one of the, my favorite things. The car I had before this one, it was a, a pickup truck. And every day I got in it, I was just, I, I always left it upset or angry. I couldn't stand the thing. And you know, when you're starting your day out that way, yeah. with something that bugs you. Yeah. And then I got this thing, and every time I get in this, I've got a little smile. You seen that new truck Tesla, Tesla put out? I have not. It looks like the future, man. Like it's like out of a sci-fi and movie, and they're I guess they're producing it, and they're cheap. And they're cheap. And it's got an exoskeleton. The body can, panels can stop a nine millimeter bullet. It's That's <laughs> amazing. Buddy is shaking that car world up. Oh, he is. Big time. Well, do you know that what's about to happen this year is apparently price of the batteries for these electric cars has been dropping so precipitously. 2020, they are going to become cheaper than internal combustion. That and is think such about good that. news, man. Think about that. It was supposed to be another three years. Wow. But like you put it on the graph, so the you know the cost of your internal combustion. There's no places where the price is going down. This no, is the materials and everything is, else. Yeah. But with the battery technology, it's just going straight down like this. So at a certain point, it's going to become cheaper than internal combustion. Something that's cool about the uh, electric battery technology too is like, this is really fun, but it for me it has a little bit of a guilt yeah. thing to it. You're yeah. kind of driving around using up gas that so you don't particularly yeah. need to be. Yeah. So if you could charge your four by four with the sun and come out here guilt-free that will be an amazing oh, day yeah. not only do you know does the cost of you know refueling go down to pennies mm -hmm. there's no maintenance no, there's no moving there parts you remember the who killed the electric car movie they took the electric car to the mechanic and he said they said what do you do he goes uh, i clean the windshield <laughs> 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 so, I mean, wow. and then they buried those for the longest time because they're not selling oil. It's not wrecking parts. But with an electric car, it just goes. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so once you've bought it, you're out of their, oh, I know. Out of their grip a little bit. So You're so right about Elon Musk. Like, what he has done, oh. you know, is he going to go bust? He's, gonna, he's revolutionized oh, the I world. Know, man. All right, buddy. You want to get out and uh, yeah, do let's, some... Let's, let's do some exploring. We're not going to be able to drive down there, but... There we go. What are we doing here? This is a mine. This is a mine down here? Oh my God. Anyway, this, this is down. where you live? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm an actual caveman. Oh my gosh. Cut oh my here. God, we're just going to ski right down here. Probably whatever they're mining is somewhat in there, I suppose. Hmm. I'm not much of a geologist. Holy crap. Oh my God. I am feeling primal fear right now. You want to go down? Let's do it. <sighs> okay. Do you smell animal feces? <laughs> <laughs> or human? <laughs> I think I read too many horror novels to be <laughs> coming gotta... down into here. Look at that, Mike. Oh my God. Do you think there's anything down there? This is only one way to find out. <laughs> I guess really all I have to do is beat you to the top of the hill, <laughs> not whatever's coming out of here. I'm pretty quick. <laughs> Look at that, pheasant? Uh, a grouse, I think. Grouse? Yep, a spruce grouse. Oh, nice. They got all kinds of stupid, those things. Oh, yeah? Uh, they're, yeah, they just kind grouse. of walk around and they don't seem to be too afraid of you. Did you ever do any hunting? Uh, when I was young. Yeah, I did too. I kind of kind of gave it up for the guilts, but. Yeah, I, I don't, I can't see myself going out. Maybe a duck hunting venture, but I don't know. 
I don't feel too bad about hunting birds, but uh, deer is a is another whole thing, man. When yeah. you get into mammals, it's uh, pretty intense, I would imagine. Yeah. I've got deer sleeping in my backyard too, so I guess when you're around them a lot, you feel less like killing them, except yeah. when they eat my tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they don't eat tomatoes. in the garden, they step on. <laughs> you ever get a tune stuck in your head and you just can't oh, yeah. get it? Oh yeah. What, what do you have? Heard it in a love song. Oh yeah, I've got. I'm getting the picking that up off you as well. It's a good song. It is a good song. You know, Heard it in a love it's probably the song. only time you really hear someone rocking the flute. <laughs> if that is a flute. You look like you got a pretty good head of hair there. It's thinning and nothing I, stays the same. I discovered I thought I had a hair peninsula and it's actually a hair island. <laughs> so, <laughs> I took got the razor out, man, in the summer and shaved her bald. And, How'd you like uh, that? Uh, the convenience factor is incredible, man. How, and, do you, how do you look with a shaved head? Uh, I thought it was yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, know, it, like, some guys yeah, just have a nicely shaved head. Yeah, looks, it, it looks was, sort of normal. It wasn't the end of the world. I'm kind of trying to grow it out now again and I'm sure it's getting the, or the uh, island back, but uh, you know, you gotta, you're old man, whatever, shave it off. It's kind of like those, there's a death of a thousand cuts. Yeah, you know, and, it uh, totally is, man. You, you, do, you do have to kind of submit to it, you know, you got the bald spot, totally. you know, whatever you got going on, it's like, yeah, it's it's me. And also, you know, you know, I think we like to, you know, sort of pretend that we're kind of cheating, you know, father time yeah. to some extent, and of course, we're not. You do audio books, Mike? I do, in the car. Yeah. That or podcasts. Um, yeah, my really... wife's kind of converted to podcasts. Is that right? She's turned me on to a couple, but they, well, they're very similar, right? There's, you know, oh, it's right. good storytelling. Uh -huh. and... I had a great, a uh, really great experience. One night I was working and I was driving late at night and it was like a rainy, kind of really uh, good setting. Uh, and I was listening to a Stephen King horror book. Oh yeah. And it was just so cool, man. The rain and the lightning and the story. And were you getting pretty spooked? I was pretty spooked, yeah, man. And I mean, I mean I'm out in the middle of absolutely nowhere by myself in a car, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, it was a, the setting made the story in that case, I guess. Do we go down into the mud pit? Oh my. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, oh, that was oh, nasty. This is crazy. Oh my god, dude. Jesus. I know why this bar is here now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really digging being in the passenger seat too. Which Are you I really? I thought okay. it was going to be like terrifying, but uh, yeah, no, it's fun. And oh. you know what? If, if something breaks, it's yeah. I've got an we'll excellent just, mechanic. Yeah, he'll, he'll just he'll helicopter take. him in. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do now, Mike? There's nothing to winch into here. I think if we can just come around a yeah. bit more to the right. Oh, no. I guess I can let go of the bar now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might have got it. Please don't be the end of my vehicle here. Okay, take her slow. There we go. Take her slow. Take her slow, bud. It's never gonna crawl up that in snow. Then yeah, we gotta come out. We gotta come out maybe at the top before I get to that rock, that boulder. Yeah. We're ready to try this. What do you think, man? 
we're gonna give it our best shot, man. You got a line picked out? I do. It's too big. Go, Go back down. down. <gasps> it's alright. Yep. Oh boy. Look at what we hit. A cliff? <laughs> A cliff. There's no getting around it. Ooh. This is nutty. Man. I smell the oil or something. It's that one big thing to get by that. Eh? Come on, baby. Go girl, go girl, go girl, go. Okay, here we go. Oh yeah, Mike. Pop it up over there. Go, 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 Mike, you're a champion! Oh my god, that was insane! That was insane! Oh, Kevy. That scared the shit out of me. That was crazy. I fucking love long underwear, man. So comfortable. Totally, man. I like being out in the cold. If I have the right shit on it. If I you have really the right shit like, on, it's a pretty good I'm, feeling. It actually. is a really good feeling, though. Yeah, I've got a little suit that I wear, developed over several <laughs> years, and I am can be comfortable in almost well, anything. Well, you know, if you invest in the right stuff, it, mm -hmm. it lasts forever. Because totally. you don't use it. Like, yeah. It doesn't wear out like you're not in it every day, typically. But I've got a strict no fucking... Um, crappy shit policy now yeah for the most part i try to buy if i'm gonna buy something you might yeah. as well buy a decent one once i fucking like texas man i like their no bullshit policy mm -hmm. like you're on your own be a fucking adult and try to stay alive hmm. so i was down in san antonio man you know the san river antonio. you know the river walk in san antonio mm -hmm, I do. so i'm asking a guy i'm like um don't do people f fall in that river because there's all the bars along, and then it's just a drop off into the river. Oh, yeah. He's like, people fall in there all the time. <laughs> I'm like, if that was in Canada, we would have a glass, eight foot tall thing trying to protect people from themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. Told this guy about I had a snowmobile and driving on a frozen lake, and he's like, lakes freeze? <laughs> like, <laughs> fucking, are you fucking kidding me? You've never fucking seen a frozen lake? He's like, no, I've never. Never, he's from Texas. Blew me away that a person had never seen a frozen lake. But I guess there's probably a million things yeah. in Texas I haven't seen. Well. Here's a fucking story. So we were standing at bed and breakfast. And as you know, the gun thing down there is pretty, uh, pretty intense. And they have concealed carry. I'm talking to the guy who owns a bed and breakfast and just asking him kind of curious about the gun thing. And he's like, well, I took a gun course so I can carry a 45. And I was at the bar one time and I had a cigar and I flicked my cigar out into the street and there was a bicycle cop and he came over and he's like, go pick that up, idiot. And let's see your driver's license, all that stuff. So when you present the driver's license in Texas and you have a concealed carry permit, you have to give them that too. So he gives the guy his concealed carry permit and the cop is like, where's your gun? He goes, I left it home. And the cop's like, what do you mean you left it home? You should have that gun with you all the time. And the guy's like, well, at, at my gun course, they said, if you're going to the bar, leave your gun at home. And he's like, no, you should have that gun in your car. Why? To defend yourself against oh whatever in the world. Like, can you even fathom? I cannot, I cannot. So anyway, man, oh, and not to fucking bore the tits off you with Texas stories, but so we come down to breakfast one day in the bed and breakfast. And there's the papers lying there, and it's this lady has shot an intruder. And what she did was put her pump shotgun against the door and pulled the trigger. And the load went through the door and killed this, like, 21-year-old or something. And we're She heard somebody trying to get into her front door? Scraping around at the front door or whatever, and just put the gun on the door and pop, blew, him, blew this fucking dude away. And what was the guy doing out there? He was trying to break into her oh, house. So anyway, um, I'm like, oh my God, she's going to jail, right? But he's like, she's gonna get a medal. <laughs> you, know, like you don't go to jail. He's like, they were on her property. They were trying to get into her house. Don't do that. 
Scary old world down yeah. here. Can you imagine if this thing broke down out here and we just all of a sudden had to walk it out of here? <laughs> no, I can't. You think we'd make it? It would be painful. It would be painful. People have done it though, you know what I mean? But there's no, there's no stopping. You've yeah. got to keep going forward. Yeah. Kind of like that, uh, is it Cheney Winja? Yeah. 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 Trying to get home. Trying to get home, man. Yeah. What a heartbreaking story. Yeah. So powerful. So powerful, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, you know, that, that story, Secret Path and Chani Wenjack uh, running away from his residential school, like when Gordon and I first came across that, I, I think it was just, just feel how universal it was. Like, oh, yeah. It's really indigenous boy, you know, it's just yeah. trying to get home. How like, many, that, that how many is times just, has it happened? Oh like, my, that's one example of, of what? Thousands? Thousands. thousands yeah. And thousands of kids who didn't make it. Um, but just that instinct to try to get home. You see the track stretching out for hundreds of kilometers. Yeah. The power of that story, I think, is universal. He's trying to get home. The isolation he must have felt, you know, yeah. like uh, I'm on my own and no one's coming. Yeah. Like, it's just so scary. And it, I think things change when you have kids too, right, Mike? It changes your perspective on stories. And because you, you always put your own kid into the situation, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're just. Well, like beside yourself with grief because of... Oh, yeah. My son, Will, was 12 at the time. Yeah. And that's what I thought immediately. I'm like, can you imagine totally. if I, my son yeah. was out in the elements, northern Ontario, in a windbreaker, <laughs> trying to walk 600 kilometers? Like, it just it breaks your heart. Yeah, it really does. But I also, I think, you know, even for that, that story, you don't even need to be a parent just to recognize, oh, oh there's of so many yeah. things wrong oh, with this. Oh, totally, totally, as a parent, totally. It just adds another little uh, oh, yeah. level to it, you yeah. know what I mean? It makes it very visceral and, and then, very real. Yeah, and then it's the separation that they've taken that child. Someone's taken that child away from his parents. That part, too, just, like, crushes you. Yeah. Do you think things are getting better? For Indigenous yeah. people? You know, I'll tell you what I think is happening. I think more Canadians, non-Indigenous, are talking about it. I don't think we've made much of a dent in becoming a more equitable country. But I think that Canadians are waking up to what we did um, to a race of people. The Downey Wenjack Fund, we are putting almost all our efforts into the schools. That's where for yeah, this generation. Good one, man. And, and they are they are being raised knowing the true history of Canada. We're pushing with these legacy schools and working with these educators that they go beyond reconciliation. Reconciliation to me is is the pathway. The goal, I think, is just a greater understanding and appreciation of the indigenous way of seeing the world, you know, and it doesn't mean we're going to adopt it, but if we can understand it, I mean, they've been here for thousands of years. Totally. You learn, you learn things. Yeah. Like, you yeah. really do. Oh, you really do, yeah. So, I mean, Gordy said it would take 100 years. All those government programs were in place for so long, it's uh -huh. going to take so much time. Totally. Know? And I remember the first time I heard your brother's band. Oh yeah. Um, it literally blew my doors off. Really? Uh, I were, couldn't. Where were you? I got an after hours job painting the office and this guy gave me a tape and I put it in a little boom box I had, turned it on and literally stopped painting. And just, I was just absolutely for it. It was up to here. Up to here. Yeah. It was kind of a soundtrack to growing up for me and in my university years. I don't know. It made me really proud to be Canadian. You Is know, that right? You know, when I heard Wheat Kings. Do I don't know. It was the, you know, the line in Wheat Kings where it's um, hung with pictures of our parents' prime ministers. Yeah. That line just floored me. Is and that right? It made me really proud to be Canadian. I felt like someone was putting Canada into poetry that my generation, everybody could relate to, you know? And, and I think it was that, that pride thing in Canada. I, uh, I call it uh, a humble patriotism. Yeah, and warts and all, too. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, the song Trickle Down, I'm sure. Uh, you know, talking about the police and cronyism and, and things like that. Anyway, I, I just was completely and totally blown away um, all throughout hmm. the band's career. But here's something I heard when they were first getting going. Gord said, this isn't going to work if one of us is driving a Lada and one of us is driving a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> so the boys did a five-way split yeah, on, on, on things. That always struck me as having such forethought to, to realize what was going to happen and to head it off yeah. before anybody's feelings got pinched. You know, I think that's what happens. You start off your, you know, five five friends from the same high school and 
you got to put that stuff in place very, very early. I mean, how many talented bands that have legs just disintegrate? Yeah. Like you think of uh, Oasis, and, you know, and I mean, that's brotherly yes. <laughs> love, which I can and you can relate to. Sometimes yeah. you can get into yeah. real fierce battles with your sibs, but, yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, those guys could have... They could have had another 10 years of making brilliant music, yeah. but their personalities got No, it's true. And, you know, <laughs> that whatever that formula is, sometimes you make the mistake of saying that's a replaceable piece. Mm -hmm. And yet, you yep. know, you, get, you change up the formula too much and you just can't get back there. Yeah, that component was doing more yeah. than it looked like it was doing. That's right. What was it like growing up with Gord in your family, man? Well, I'll tell you, man, I had a, I had a moment when... <laughs> Early days of the hip, um, my wife and I, Caroline, well, my girlfriend at the time, we were living in Montreal, and I went to this uh, the Stepaner, and uh, I was going through the magazine rack, and I pulled out this music magazine. It was you know, pretty thin, and Canadian music magazine, perhaps. Anyway, I'm going through it, and there's a picture of my brother, the <laughs> tragically hip, and there I am in this little depth in Montreal, and my jaw dropped. I couldn't, really? Oh, you weren't expecting it? I wasn't expecting it. I mean, Holy. I still have the magazine. Nice, man. I was so shocked. And and I just thought, oh my God, it's it's happening. That and, is crazy. And yet, you know, of course, it's just this little music mag. But it, it, it was everything. Anyway, they came to town. They, we had a one-bedroom apartment. All six of us stayed with us. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> yeah. We had one couch. Uh, yeah. These guys came with sleeping bags. You know, that's how a, you do it in the beginning. Oh, isn't for it? sure. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. you don't spend also a dime. You, do you don't yeah. spend a dime on, totally. a, on a hotel or anything. They all came in with sleeping bags, um, oh, and awesome. then, you know, we would have had, you know, a few drinks after the show at I think it was at uh, the Spectrum, and it was a big night, like so exciting. And we wake up the next morning, and not only are they gone, everything's neat as a pin. Seriously, all the dishes have been washed, even though. Wasn't their dishes? That's how you and get invited back. That's how you get. That's, and they, that was yeah. that was their modus operandi. You couldn't tell anybody had been there. You saw some shows in those early days. Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, the first one I ever saw was in our university cafeteria. Oh, and oh my! The barrier between the band and the uh, crowd was tipped over at tables. Yeah. <laughs> and that one got intense too, man. Did it? Did the kids get pretty excited? Oh my god! The uh, crowd started kind of bumping into the gear. And the boys were like, "Get you got to get back! You're hitting our stuff." <laughs> it was just a gong show and a half, man. But I just remember that like it was yesterday, man. Did you you must have seen a lot of shows, did you? Yeah, yeah, I, I, oh, I did. Wow, this is insanity. Totally. We did a documentary called Hex and Kettle on the another roadside attraction from 1993. Mm -hmm. We went right across the country, three camera crews, and the one show in Markham Fairgrounds, we just dedicated it to like being in the mosh pit with the kids coming over. And we had a camera on the stage looking down, you know, getting some performance, but getting it from the perspective, Neat. like right in there. And it was like a war zone. Oh. It was unbelievable. The kids were surfing. They were. Some of them were surfing just to get out of the crush up yeah. front, yeah. and it was it was scary. We were in Moncton, and um, he's kind of in the, like a the tunes were going on, but it was something about change, and he started saying, "Give me your change, give me your change," and people oh, started pulling like their pocket change out yeah. and whipping it, and you could see it flicking through the lights, and it, then it was like, "Oh, oh. stop!" <laughs> Stop throwing, what was he thinking? stop throwing metal at me. Oh my God. <laughs> like it felt like it got big really fast. You know what happened is they put out that first one with the last American accent. Yeah, yeah. Then the, just up the to here hit. came and it absolutely kicked ass. And then Road Apples came and yes. it absolutely kicked it ass. Absolutely kicked ass. And you know, a lot of bands stole on that sophomore effort, right? Oh. And they it's did the not, hardest thing. And, and then they just kicked the doors in too with fully complete yeah. next, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and then that was day for night. Day for night yeah. was was just absolutely. No, they they did what's and Gord had back, he man. had so much pride that they had put together those first. I mean, you could argue five or six even records 
with all those hits. Yeah. And, and, and listen to every single song and every single one of those albums, and there's not a dud amongst them. You know, it's yeah. it's an incredible accomplishment. It is. It is. Was and Gord all, uh, was Gord writing all the time? Like was he? He was always. I mean, the one thing that Gord understood was to always be grabbing little shards of lines. He always had the. He always had the moleskin in his back pocket, mm -hmm. and he had the four-colored, uh, you know, big pen. And when somebody said something, <laughs> or if he read something, it went in the book. So he just, he just was always, you know, in the acquisition, you know, sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I heard the story, as I'm sure you have, of uh, Little Bones was um, that taxi driver said to them, you know, be careful of those that chicken. It's got all them little bones, and that's where the yeah. little some right. taxi driver driving them to a yeah. shower or something like that. All those little bones. He had such a great turn of phrase, man. Yeah. He had such good instincts for that, to leave enough different ideas going on, you know. In many ways, I think they were kind of just, they were fragments that he stitched mm -hmm. together. Yeah, yeah. And created something. So that there isn't, you know, besides stories like, you know, about Milgard and, you know, Wheat Kings, there's not a a story that is complete there. It, Oftentimes it, the story changes in the middle of a song. Like there's yeah. a couple of storylines in Well, the that's songs, also, I think, know, where you don't uh, get into, you're not flogging something. You know right. what I mean? Like where yeah. you're not like, oh, I guess we better keep on this theme. It's like, no, just go in a new direction. They, oh, they, they, yeah. they yeah. you know, if they connect, they connect. The last concert was so emotional for me. The whole country, I mean, the whole dang country tuned into that. It's, it's, an, it's an, an amazing, an, an amazing thing. And you know, for the for the last time, they brought us all together again. Yeah. yeah. And then to be able to do it in such a powerful way in Kingston, and then it brings up the indigenous thing. Yeah. And he has the half the country watching, and oh, half yeah. the country's going, "What? What's he saying? What's he saying?" Yeah. And um, like that was so important uh, to him to just in that artful way to just say, "We got to figure this out." Wake up a little bit. We got to figure yeah. this out. And, and you know, it's kind of it's like the last thing I'm leaving with you. I've I've done a lot. I've sung about this country in different ways. I've created this kind of you know this feeling of. You know, pride, but you know, we got work to do. Let's not be too quick to pat mm -hmm. ourselves on the back. Yeah, you know? totally. And and all that trust that he'd built up with all those people for all those yeah. years, and it was like he was finally going to cash it in he just used, a little bit. Yeah, he, he used, used it, it properly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and he says, "There's one line. It kind of breaks my heart." He says, "We got the prime minister. He's going to help us. He's going to get us where we need to go." Mm -hmm. he says, but we're gonna figure it out and then you can just there's just a little thing and he's like I'm not gonna be here and he says you're gonna figure it out you're gonna figure it out and it's like wow that is just like he's just passing yeah. the baton he's just like I'm not gonna be here yeah but you're gonna figure this thing out you've got to figure this thing out and that's exactly what was on his mind too yeah. right like to help to yeah to help didn't didn't mention cancer didn't mention the thing Which that was, was basically didn't, didn't. killing him yeah he mentioned something about uh, you know for uh, others yeah yeah and and you know uh, a, a race of people that as he said people that we've been trained to ignore like this these are things that are coming to him he has trouble remembering the lyrics to his own songs I know and yet and and he was able to just reach up and pull down these these pieces of just like people that we've been trained to ignore like it's almost like divine like the mm -hmm. it's coming through him because yeah. his cognitive powers had been I mean they weren't terrible but they'd been diminished for him definitely and you're up you're standing in front of millions of people and you're just freestyling and and these are the things that are coming out cuff. he's yeah. off the cuff yeah 100% Crazy, man. yeah Class but you know arts. he always did that right in those shows when he would do those stream of consciousness mm -hmm. none of that was memorized prepared and when you listen to the recordings of it they're like word perfect mm -hmm. they make they're they're outstanding and they are like a, a little story in the middle of a song. That's what's on my mind at the moment. And, and he could just do it. it. Takes a lot of courage just to uh, speak your mind when you're not fully, pre fully oh, prepared yeah. to know what's going to come out. Too, oh yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, if you got to trust yourself. Yeah. And, and, totally. And you know, it's about just it's just letting go, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like let, letting yourself just let it flow through you, you know. And, and he had that ability. There's some beautiful performances out there, and um, it's they still. They still blow my mind when I watch them. You know, it's like, did I really?
share a room with that guy for 20 years. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you did. That's your little brother. Well, you're in you're in the song, right? It's uh, the yeah. Melgar song. Uh, I mean, 38 years old. My, uh, oh, is it? That's 38 years old. Oh, that's, yeah. that's the Kingston Penitentiary right. uh, jail, yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, roughly. Right. Oh, back the curtain for my older brother, Mike. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're immortalized in the song. I know. That everybody knows. I know. That's crazy. Isn't I know. It, it was. <laughs> I was so proud when he, he brought that song oh, to our apartment. That. Uh, he just got back from Memphis, I think, or New Orleans, where they record it, and just said, "I just want to play this for you, and if you're not okay with it, then it won't go on the record." No, I, you know, I'm just thinking. Well, oh, I think I'm going to be okay oh, with it. <laughs> Did you ever get lost in the woods? I don't think I have been lost. Um, like, lost, lost. I don't think so. I got moderately lost one time when I was out hunting. Oh. And it started to get dark, and I didn't really know where I was. And as it started to get darker and darker, I started to panic. And um, then I was running through the woods with my gun. You were running? I was running, because I was where like... Where were you running to, do you know? No, just, I was just running. Yeah. Running somewhere to, to get somewhere, and I had no clue. And so then I, I was like, okay, you got to stop, man. Stop, 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 stop. And I figured it out. So I just had this, like, little moment of uh, sitting still. And then I heard the bass beat from a Zep tune. <laughs> I was like, I followed the, the bass beat out. And it was a bunch of guys uh, in a hunting cabin with a stereo outside cranking oh tunes and drinking beer and I was just like oh my god thank god and asked them where they pointed me the right direction and I got home but I was terrified they gave me several beers I was terrified dude well that's Zeppelin can come in handy <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. save your life thanks for watching make sure you subscribe to the channel to get stuck with me again in the next video <laughs> that was awesome man <laughs> That was awesome. I almost went in for a kiss there. <laughs> <laughs> I would have accepted. Thanks, thanks, buddy. That Thank was you. I had so no much idea. Fun. I had no idea it'd be that much fun to drive this thing. I had no idea. I had no idea it could do that. <sighs> that was uh, absolutely yeah. incredible. Your driving skills are to be oh, admired. Oh, thank you very much. Let's go, I have to go change my shorts. <laughs> <laughs>